Okay, let's go. Um, let's begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Victor, a current president of IOSA Outreach Group, and we welcome you to the seventh edition of IOSA seminars this year due to the current situation. Uh, we will do it online. For those who don't know us, um, we are uh, IOSA, the outreach uh, activity, uh, so this, I, I mean, the USA student chapter in the Institute of Optics uh, in the CSIC. And this group is composed of young researchers working at different, on different fields related to optics. We usually perform different outreach activities, going to schools, performing workshops, to universities. And the final activity of every year is usually these seminars where we all gather uh, to, to know more about the research carried out in our institute. Uh, this year uh, has been special because there has been several incorporations to the scientific staff of, of the Institute and uh, we want to con congratulate them all for, the, for their new position and we have the pleasure to come with the presence of all of them as well as with other researchers from the Institute. Unfortunately, we could not fit Alejandro Ferrero in the schedule of this year, but we hope he can join uh, in next, next editions. So let's begin with the seminars. Uh, just a reminder to all the speakers uh, to try to adapt to the time because we have a very tight schedule. And also a reminder to the audience that the chat is always open uh, to questions and we will try to answer all of them after each talk. So feel free to ask uh, our speakers by, by the chat, using the chat. So without further delay, I will present our first speaker Pablo Santa Fe, PhD student from the Optical Radiation Measurements Group, who will talk about the traceable measure of BSSRBF. Uh, so Pablo, when you want to share your screen, you okay. are able to. Thank you. Um, let me know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. And I'm going to try to put the video. Okay, <laughs> so let's begin. I'm going to share the screen. Great. Okay. You are saying only the, the slide, don't you? Yes, we are. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Pablo Santa Fe Gavarda, and I'm a PhD student in the Optical Radiation Measurements Group of the Institute of Optics. I'm going to present my recent research, um, which has the following title: the "Receivable Measure of PSSRDF." And what we are going to, to introduce now is the, the definition of the PSSRDF. Well. This um, is a function, a, a distribution function, which relates the emergent radiance of any position on a surface of an object or a sample with the incident radiant flux in, in this object or, or this sample. In the Institute of Optics, we ha uh, it has been developed a system to measure the, this function, and it, it is the, the one that you are seeing in the slide. We have an incandescent light as a light source attached to a monochromator, which provides us to measure in different wavelengths. We have an optical uh, system to lead the, the beam to, um, to the sample. The sample um, rests in a, in a robot arm and, and we also have a detection system, which is placed on a platform that can move around the, the circular rail that you can see in the picture. So uh, we have, we can differentiate uh, three subsystems. The first one is the lighting system, which is composed by, by these instruments. And, and here you can see the specifications of some of them, uh, but I don't wanna uh, lose time with that. Uh, I, want, I want to, to focus on the filtered wheel. Uh, this is a, a filtered wheel with five different positions with 
one position where we don't have uh, any filter, it means we have the 10, the 100 of percent of transmittance. Another position where we have an opaque filter, which means 0% uh, transmittance. And three other positions with three neutral density filters with 10, 1, and 0.01% of transmittance. Uh, the other subsystem, uh, it will be the sample positioning system, which is the a robot arm, with, which has six spin axes and a vacuum sucker to hold the, the sample. Uh, we can control this robot arm uh, automatically with the computer or manually with, with the controller that you can see uh, in the bottom of the slide. As a detection system, we have a CCD camera um, with an objective lens, uh, and it has this, the following specifications. The, measure, the measures that we are taking um, are uh, acquisitions at different geometries, and these geometries are defined by the, the spherical coordinates, the polar and the azimuthal spherical coordinates, of the illumination and the collection beams, as you can see in, in the diagram. These are the samples that, that I have measured. Uh, as you can see, the, these are translucent samples and we have different levels of translucency and we also have three white samples. So to calculate the, the BSSRDF, uh, we cannot use the, the definition because uh, it implies parameters that we we cannot uh, direct directly measure in the in the laboratory. So we have to implement uh, measurement equations uh, with the parameters that we already uh, can measure in in our laboratory. So this will be our measurement equation. As a first result, we have obtained these uh, BSSRDF images. Uh, here I'm, I am representing the, the values of the BSSRDF at each pixel of the, of the image of the sample in a specific uh, measurement geometry and, and wavelength for all the, the samples that, we, that I have shown you. Uh, if we uh, cuts only the, the central line, we can represent the, the profile of the BSRDF and we can better see the, the how it changes uh, with, the, with the distance from the illumination spot. Another interesting representation is the angular distribution. To understand that, uh, we have to define the samples coordinate system and we are going to use a, a radial and a polar coordinate the radial polar the radial coordinate rho and the polar coordinate alpha in that way we can represent the angular distribution of five different points in the in the same distance to the illumination spot in in a specific illumination polar angle and as you can see, uh, we have a, a very good results and a, and a very good um, distributions of the BSRDF. So the, the measures that we are uh, taking are, are really good. Now uh, we are planning to, to improve the system. And to do that, we have first of, first of all, uh, to optimize the, the optical light system because we want more irradiance at the, at the surface of the sample. We also have a new detection system, which is a thermos camera with a low redox noise. So we could um, uh, get a lower answer scientists of the, in the measures. And, and we are going to do next is to regrade the equation measurement uh, taking into account the, the new parameters of the new detection system and we have to determine also the, the parameters that characterize the new measurement installation. So basically what we are going to do is um, improve our system and, and get new measures of the BSSRDF.
And that's all. Thanks for your attention and thanks, Yosa, for the invitation. Okay, thank you so much, Pablo. Um, let's see if there's any questions from the audience. Is there any question in the chat? <clears throat> no. Okay, I, I do have a question. Um, so okay. which could be the direct implement implementation of your measurements? Um, the, the principal objective is to do an intercomparison with another institute, which is in the same project as, as us. But in, and with these measures, we want to uh, to test the models of the BSRDF. And with these models, uh, we could uh, improve the, the uh, I don't know the name. Uh, well, the, the simulations in the computers to, to recreate the, the appearance of, of some objects. For example, when you see a, a Pixar movie in and you are seeing these, these characters. Um, if we have a better uh, models of, of this rendering, uh, these, these characters will be more realistic. So Same. these are the principal applications and, and where we are in, and what the, the project is, is aiming. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, so thank you, Pablo. Um, Let's go to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Alberto De Castro, a new tenure scientist at the Institute of Optics. Um, he got his PhD in visual science and carried out postdoctoral research between the University of Indiana and, and the CSIC. And also we, we want to congratulate him especially for your new position because he was one of the founders of, of IOSA, of our group. Uh, thank you for that, Alberto. And today he will talk about the effect of fixation alive movements in topography measurements with OCT. Again, thank you for accepting our invitation and, and now you're sending your screen. So whenever you want, thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you for organizing, and thank you for thinking of, um, of the four of us, of the five of us who to to share part of our um, part of the projects that uh, we are working on. So I'm going to talk about one of the projects that I've been working uh, these next years that involves fixation alike movements and topography measurements with OCT. So if you think about it, we are constantly moving our eyes to look to get information from the from the world. Right, uh, we are more prone to uh, fixate on salient figure, salient uh, uh, features. So for example, we look at a, a lot of eyes and the mouth of a, of a picture, and but we also we tend to do this kind of movement. So if there are fast saccades, I don't know if you see my mouse, but I'm pointing. There are five. There are fast saccades, and we fixate on a point, and then we do a saccade and we fixate again. So what you may not know is that. We, even when we are fixating, even when we have just a tiny dot to look at, we are moving our eyes. And the movement is very similar to the movements we do when we fixate in here. Uh, so uh, our eyes is, is constantly moving. We can talk later about why uh, do we move uh, constantly our eyes. But even when we fixate, we, are, we have a combination of these three movements. We have a drift, which is a kind of a random walk. I have here a figure of uh, eye movements recorded for two seconds. And as you see, there are some messy uh, movements uh, uh, in, in this part, in this central part. And um, it's a random walk. It's very similar to Brownian motion. If you are uh, familiar with that motion, uh, we are always drifting our eyes, slow, slowly drifting our eye from the pictures. Right? There are micro saccades, which are marked in red here. And they are rapid eye movements, very small, and it can be suppressed by some observers if they are uh, very attention. Um, and we have also tremor. We don't see it in this figure, but all that line is um, is convolved with a very high frequency, very small uh, tremor of the eye. It's a, it's a very complex uh, movement. There are models of these fixational eye movements because they are important for many 
different things. One of the models most well known is the one developed by the group of Engberg. And as you see, it's a, it's a random walk. It's not exactly a random walk because it tends not to intersect with itself. Uh, and every now and then it does a sake. So it's called a random walk in a potential pit because this is what we do. We never drift a lot from the fixation point. When we drift a lot, there is a micro saccade or we tend to drift to the fixation point that would be in the center, okay? So we can measure these fixation ally movements and this has been studied for a long time. The most um, better eye tracker that we can build, that, that have been built is uh, the dual Purkinje eye tracking. So when we study the reflex of the light in the cornea and on the posterior surface of the crystalline lens, the difference between these two images is very informative of the rotation of the eye. So we can have a very precise measurement of the rotation of the eye. But we can also see that when we image the retina of a patient, if you of a subject, if we, we ask a subject to fixate on a dot and we image the retina, we, we see something like this. As you see, the retina is constantly moving, and this is, I mean, it's not that it's the eye is constantly moving, right? Uh, even if we look at the individual frames, we can see some frames where apparently there is no motion and other frames where there's been clearly a drift motion um, uh, during the frame because these movements are very fast. What we usually do, what people usually do to study the retina is to align all these frames and make an average of the video so that we have a higher signal to noise ratio. And they realize that this is a great eye tracker. In this work by Stevenson and Rurda, they compare the eye movement um, recorded with an ASLO and with the dual Purkinje. And as you see, there is a very good correspondence. This is another way of, of looking at the fixation eye movement. There's been researchers that have uh, looked directly at the pupil. So if we illuminate uh, with a laser the retina and we get a high speed pupil camera, we can see the pupil back illuminated and first holding this image, we have a very clear image of the pupil. And the Harman sac, if you think about it, is uh, Harman sac Harmans are usually uh, um, used to measure the aberrations of the eye, but they have, using the intensity of each spot, we can create an image that is very similar to the back illuminated pupil um, uh, of the eye. So using these two techniques, the researchers showed that there was no difference between the measurements done by both techniques. Of course, the Sarkarman is a bit lower resolution, but as you see the error, the difference between them is always uh, very small, very close to zero. We can also measure the fixation eye movements with OCT. OCT is an imaging technique, I will talk about it later. But if we image again and again the same meridian in time, we would see a slow drift of the, of the pupil and here are what appears to be a slow saccade in one direction, right? We can only measure the movement in the vertical direction. Uh, if we don't scan at all and we only uh, position the beam on the center of the pupil, we would see the actual motion. This is um, uh, something that hasn't been reported that often, but the eye is also moving actually, little movements. Uh, um, probably because the, move, the, the lateral movements implicate, uh, imply uh, axial movements too. So we can also see the eye movements. And if you look at this image, if you get closer to the screen and you look at the, at the dot in the center of the image, and uh, I want you to adapt for this experiment, so you have to be looking at the dot for, for some time. If you are a good fixator, you start to see the lines that disappear and you start to see funny effects around the, around the dot. And if I remove the grid uh, and you keep looking at the, at the dot, you will hopefully see the, the, um, the image of the grid superimposed, right? Um, and you will, you will see, if you repeat this experiment, you will, you can be, you, you, sometimes I'm able to see, to differentiate between the drift and the saccades. I'm able to see the saccades and I can even count the saccades per se. So I hope that I convince you that there are uh, fixation ally movements. Um, uh, I'm going to use a technique called OCT, which is the equivalent to ultrasound using optics. So if we have a laser and we split the light in a reference arm and in a sample arm, is the light when reflected will interfere and the interference will be bigger when there is a change of refractive index. So we have an image, we could have an image in depth in the sample and by moving this beam right and left with the scanners, we could have an image of the sample.
okay, this is brain luminosity and the spectral luminosity, you may have heard about it. It doesn't involve moving mirror, the moving is fixed. And we study the spectral component of the light reflected and by Fourier transforming this information, we can have the same image, the same image in depth of the sample. Okay, so this technique is one of the examples of the, of the technique that has had a big impact in, in ophthalmology. It was invented in 19, well, it was started in 1991. In 1993, this is the first image of the in vivo retina that we had. It was a bit of a revolution because back then we didn't have images of the tissue in depth. It was the first time we could see several layers in the retina in vivo, right? Uh, right now we can do three dimensional images. Uh, we just can not in one direction, in two directions. And we have these 3D images of wide angles of the retina with very high resolution. And even we can see behind the retina. So in here we are seeing some cord. And with this technique, we are also able to image the anterior segment of the eye. And as you see here, we can even image the retina too in the same image. So we would have, we have the, the whole uh, uh, information needed to create a model of the eye. So we have the optics of the eye and the distance between surfaces, which is uh, um, a lot of information about the eye. Um, uh, even new techniques are used in different parts of the beam to scan the anterior segment and the posterior segment of the retina. So we would have these, uh, these images of the whole eye globe, uh, which is, um, uh, I mean, quantifying these images, we would be able to do a wide angle model of, uh, of each person. No? Uh, in the Institute, we've done some work uh, using uh, OCT to, to build personalized eye models. And in this work from Men Chan San in her thesis, uh, what she did was to measure the aberrations in a patient and to use these images to create an optical model. So we can detect the, the surfaces in this image, export them to a optical design system, uh, optical design software, and explore the aberrations of the, predict the predicted aberrations should be similar to the ones measured, right? We've done this in animals, we've in, in humans, and we've done this in, in animal model too. And I've done some work exploring the possibility of using these personalized eye models to select the intraocular lens to implant in a patient. So uh, uh, a patient that is going to undergo cataract surgery, uh, if we know the position of the, where the intraocular lens is going to sit, we should be able to differentiate between different designs of intraocular lens and uh, in an optical basis, right? For a personalized, in a personalized basis. We would be able to tell which is the intraocular lens that maximizes a given optical metric for that patient, right? However, eye movements can influence the measurements. And in this work from uh, the group of ISAT, they show a very dramatic uh, image of the eye movements. We can see sometimes these images in the lab. Usually when we have these kind of images, we discard it because um, uh, we know that we can get better volumes without uh, so much a movement, right? Uh, this group is very engineer oriented. They are great engineers and they have built an, a night tracker that corrects the OCT beam on the fly. So at the moment he's correcting uh, and detecting this movement and advancing the OCT beam so that the image is not distorted. As you see, when they correct the eye movements, they can have better images of the corner, they have better resolution, and they can even see structures that are not visible in the original image. Uh, Justo Arines and Salva Barra did some study on the aberrations measurements and the effect of uh, fixational eye movements on aberrations measurements. And as you see, some modes are more difficult to reconstruct than others. Some modes are more scattered than others, right? At the Institute, we are not interested, well, we are not that interested on having good images, but we want to quantify the surfaces of the, of the eye. So I don't know how much how you follow me up to here, but we are measuring the topography of the cornea with OCTs and either lab devices or commercial devices, they have scanning features. They have a scanning to make the image. So the image is done uh, at different time points, right? And here I'm showing a schema where I'm scanning in the center of the eye. And we can do this, this so fast that we do this in different heights, right? So we take several images of the same eye at different heights, and we build these um, three-dimensional eye models, which are, uh, uh, they are volumes of information, right? 
volumes of information here. If you look carefully at the image uh, from the top, you can see the different B scans here, right? And you can even see that there has been a, a night movement at this position. So the upper part of the pupil seems displaced with the lower part. Uh, well, I'm guessing that there was a night movement here, right? You cannot rely on the shape of the pupil because there are elliptical pupils and there are, there are, there are uh, different shapes of the pupil that can change. But there is an evident eye movement in this, in this, between these two areas of the volume that we acquire, right? But with these volumes, we have a lot of information of the eye, and we have the four surfaces, and we can study the, the object, right? My question is, uh, uh, what is the effect of these fixational eye movements in the topography measurements with OCT? So in the lab, we have two OCTs uh, working right now. Uh, one of them takes uh, uh, volumetric images of the eye in 0 0.6 seconds. So it has uh, this resolution, 300 by 50 pixels. And, and, and this is a volume, so it has 2,000 in depth. Uh, and it's 25 kilohertz, 25 uh, kilohertz. The subsource OCT, the new OCT that we have is uh, way faster, it's 200 kilohertz. We've used it to do a more dense raster scan. We, we use 150 here instead of 50 you see, and the measurement takes about 0.42, okay? And we've measured a lot of subjects in the, in the lab. Uh, so I, I look at the database and there are 40, 24, I found 24 healthy subjects, 24 junk subjects, uh, in which I have, we, people have repeated measurements over and over and over for different tests, right? So we have on average, there's some of the measurements, some of the eyes, we have measured them more than 40 times. So we have very good representation of the cornea. We can average all those measurements. I have a very good estimation of the standard deviation of between measurements and of the average between measurements. On our new OCT, we have so far, I have so far analyzed the data of five subjects, but we also have a, a good number of repeated measurements on that subject. I'm going to fit the topography of the cornea to a sphere with Cerniki polynomials. I don't know how familiar you are with Cerniki polynomials, but I'm going to show this in the next two slides. So, uh, this would be a parabolic cornea, and this would be a parabolic cornea with astigmatism. As you see, the grid surface is below the surface in this part and above in this other part. We like to represent this with this color code. Blue means below, red means above, right? With another deformation, with another um, aberration, which we call a spherical aberration, the grid surface, as you see, is below the surface, above the surface, and then again below. And we represent this with the color code again blue, uh, red, and blue, that means blue is below the parabola or the sphere that we are measuring, right? So we have this, uh, you may have seen this Cerniki pyramid, uh, and this is how we, we using this set of uh, functions, we can represent the matter with shape, right? All our corners have some, 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 some curvature. Many of us have astigmatism in the cornea uh, in some directions. On average, we have we all have uh, some spherical aberration, and there are other well known such as coma and particularities that differentiate the eye from one person to the other. Right? So the results of the experiments are this: if we fit the, the data to a to a sphere with Cernikis, the radius of the sphere is different for different eyes, uh, and as you see, the the standard deviation representing the deviation between repeated measurements is different for different subjects. So I'm guessing that uh, subject 17 had less eye movements than subject 16. So that's why subject 16 standard deviation is a bit higher. If I average all those standard deviations, what we have is something like this. So on average, the standard deviation is 0.17 in the um, measurement of the radius, right? Again, each subject would have a different topography map of the cornea. And if I average the standard deviations of those topography maps, I can I have my, the figure is something like this. So there are some modes that uh, are more different when we repeat the measurement, right? And these modes are mode number six, uh, which is an astigmatism. There are some modes here that are more affected. And there are others such as this one, for example, that are very well recovered in all the subjects. It doesn't matter if it's uh, has higher eye movements or not, right? And uh, could confirm this with the new OCT, we have something similar. We have less subjects, so the standard deviation doesn't look that good, but we have very similar uh, results. I'm going to simulate this process using spherical surfaces. 
So a sphere uh, can be defined as a function of X and Y. I can make a can X and Y dependent on time. So the measurement would start here on the blue part and would end there in the yellow part. So I measure in about 0.6 seconds. I can generate I movements for those 0.6 seconds. And I can move the surface and calculate the sub of the surface move. And then fit the points uh, using the two variables that I think are correct, the OCT axis and the height that I have found with the move surface. So even if this tool doesn't look very different, one of them is a sphere with no deformations. There are no cernikis here, all cernikis are zero. And the other one is a sphere with some cernikis, uh, some deformations, uh, some differences from the sphere, right? When I do this a uh, lot of times, I, I did these simulations a hundred times, uh, the average and the standard deviations are shown on this graph. So good news is that the average of a lot of measurements is the surface that we want to measure. This was kind of expected, right? But the radius of curvature average is 7.9, which is the, the nominal surface, and the, all the cernikis are zero. As you see, there are some cernikis that are more uh, have larger standard deviations than others. This is something that we were seeing in the experimental data, and we see this in the spectral domain and also in the structure. So if I overlap the two, uh, the simulations are uh, capturing some of this variability, right? Uh, uh, some of these modes are, are have higher standard deviations, and as you see, I'm explaining part of the deviation in the radius of curvature. And here I'm only using lateral movements, and this is using models for those lateral movements. I told you that this has been studied a long time. If we use axial movements too, and I'm doing here some approximations because axial movements are not that well uh, reported in the literature. They haven't studied a lot. I'm assuming that axial and lateral movements are very similar, which I think is um, not entirely true, but uh, but the, these are the if I if I assume that la axial movements that there are axial movements on the sample, as you see the simulations got much better. This was only lateral movements. This was with axial movements. As you see, I'm capturing many of the variability. I think the red line and the the dark line are very similar here. The radius of curvature is very similar to the one to the standard deviation that we get from measurements, and we have something similar on the subsource OCT. Though we do would need more subjects to have more, more uh, to capture more the, the the data, right? Why do we want this? Uh, what do we want to do with this? Well, with this, my plan is to have a better measurement of the confidence interval. So when you do a measurement, it's important to look at the standard deviation of your data to know the confidence interval on the mean. So this is, I think, this is a way to to understand what's the precision that we can expect from OCT from these I models, right? And um, this, I'm talking about topography, but the important uh, part comes after is uh, uh, what's the optics of that eye, right? I want to know how precise can we measure the optics of the eye. And with these uh, simulations, if we assume that they are accurate, which I think we can, um, we could simulate what would happen with faster and faster OCT systems and evaluate the improvement with faster systems. Or we could even uh, study different scanning patterns. And here I've used a raster scan with a different amount of points. With 51 by 51 points, as you see, the reconstruction is not very good uh, compared to other. But as you increase the number of points, there is a point the, in, in, in 151 where there is not much improvement, right? So we could stop at this point and say, okay, we don't need more data because very quick measurement is, uh, is, is better than having a lot of measurement. We could also do a different uh, spiral scanning pattern, different pattern for scanners. Uh, and as you see, the, the, the aberrations that are not so well reconstructed are different between the two. And I, I, I kind of picture this as a uh, if, if you have a volume that is moving and you are doing a raster pattern, you would have astigmatism. And if you are doing a spiral pattern and there is a movement at this point, you would have the center displaced, so you would have some commands, some secondary commands, secondary commands, which are these two modes, these modes that are illuminated here. So uh, I don't have my own time, but I hope I, I, I have convinced you that we can simulate OCT topography measurements with fixationalized movements. There are other sources of variability, such as eye rotations, instrument and image processing precision that I haven't considered, but um, they could be considered in the future. Uh, the standard deviation that 
Uh, I predict with the, with the simulations is very similar to the standard deviation that we found in experiments. And um, the simulations, we can, we want, I want to use these simulations to study the sources of variabilities in OCT topography measurements. We estimate the 90% confidence interval in the mean of a given of a set of measurements and to study the result with different scanning patterns. The idea would be, since we are not using OCT to image, we are using OCT to measure, which is the best scanning pattern measure uh, the optical properties of the eye. And I want to finish acknowledging the funding and the visual artists and bioconic groups, which uh, uh, have a lot of members and they are all doing a lot of job to understand the optics of the eye. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alberto. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, Sara is asking if in your first trial of measurements uh, you can detect the movements, but the idea is to correct the movements in the next trial in the same subject, or are the, movement, the movements in the first and second trial be more, more or less similar or kind of correlated? Yeah. Mm, we cannot assume that the eye movements will be the same from one measurement to the other because there is a random component there. Uh, we can assume that they will be about the same amplitude. Um, uh, uh, but we cannot assume that they will be the same. Even in, in, in retinal imaging, uh, we, we tended to do the measurements in the morning because in the morning people are more relaxed and have less eye movements. And we know that long sessions make subjects to start to move a lot. So in the beginning of the session, we would have great images. By the end of the session, where tear fleeing is not so stable, so we have worse optics, but there are also more movements because people is more tired and we tend to move more. So the answer is no, we would need to either measure the eye movements on the moment and correct it somehow. There are some methods to, and, and, and Edu and I will be trying, Edu will be trying some of those. There are some methods to try to guess the, the eye movements using the volumes, using individual volumes. We could guess which are which were the measurements. And the what I have presented here is more, uh, let's see if this measurement, these eye movements is the thing that is making our data so variable. And let's um, see if it's the worth to correct it. So if you think about it with these simulations, we could create synthetic data and try to uh, devise, try to, to design some algorithms to correct the data. We know the nominal surface and we could play with the data to, 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 to see how good can we reconstruct the, the better volumes. Okay, thank you, Alberto. I do have a, a brief question. Um, it's more theoretical. Uh, for the eye movements, for the mm -hmm. algorithm to um, simulate the eye movements, is there any other algorithm? Because I, I've seen you have used this paper from Engenberg or, right? Engenberg, is there, yeah. Is there any other algorithm or that one works well? That one includes, there are, there are several papers simulating eye movements and they, do, they all do this random walk. Uh, that one is a bit more complex because it it it, it does the random walk. It's just uh, either you move up or you move left or you move uh, mm -hmm. in diagonal, but you you are constantly moving, right? That one is uh, a bit more complex because it it avoids the eye doing repetitive movements right and left, which which we know that the eye doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it in, includes the micro saccades, so it's a, it's so far I think it's a it's the it's the is the model of choice to to simulate lateral eye movements. I'd like to to found or to study in the future these axial movements because we've seen that they can have an effect in our measurements too. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think there's no more questions, Alberto. So thank you for so much again okay. for the for accepting the invitation. Thank you. And now it's the turn of Lupe, Lupe Villegas, PhD student at the Visual Optics and Biophotonics Group. And she would talk about comparison of scleral biomechanics in rabbit and porcine models using OCT. Um, Alberto, I think you should stop sharing your screen.
And then Lupe can do it. How do I stop sharing my screen? Okay, I'm going to do it okay. for you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Lupe, you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alberto, again. Okay. It's here, you can see, everyone can see the screen. Yes, it's working. Okay, can hear me well, okay. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the organization to the YOSA student chapter group. My name is Lupe Villegas. I am part of the visual optics and biophotonics lab. And today I'm going to present you how we use the OCT system that Alberto talked before for comparison, sclera biomechanics in rabbit and for sign models. So the sclera is the essential part of the integrity of the globe, is the white part of the eye. But what happened when the structure of the sclera changed? Well, variation in the structure are associated with the ocular disorders. In fact, myopia results from actual elongation of the ocular globe. This elongation is related to the biomechanical properties of the sclera. In that way, we use OCT with AirPod excitation to study biomechanical properties of the sclera. The quantification of these properties will help to identify target zones for a potential treatment for myopia control. The SWIFT uh, source optical coherence tomography with IRPOP imaging system has been developing and proof in the lab for detection of the corneal deformation in human and porcine. And also, we, it, it proves that it deforms porcine in sclera with high IRPOP pressure. Okay. In that way, uh, we continue with these studies and we put four signs and rabbit eyes in seven different localizations to compare the deformation of the behavior. So we compare the displacement at maximum deformation. And we found that, that the larger deformation displacement in rabbit that in four signs along the time, as we see also there are a higher deformation in equatorial, the grid one lines, and also, it looks like in four signs, uh, the cornea that is the blue one is closer than the superior and inferior regions, the brown and yellow. If we plot the, the maximums of all curves in the same graph, we can see that, that there is a dependency of the regions of, in the sclera deformations. Um, also, I would like to conclude that the deformation displacement depends of the localization, the R for the excitation, superior, inferior, see it really similar to corneal deformation displacement. And also we need to analyze a little more of um, equatorial nasal regions. This work is supported by different grants. And thank you for your attention. Okay, Lupe, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, okay, let me yeah. It's okay. Okay. Um, let's see if there's any question from the audience. Um, okay, I, I do have one. Um, okay. I'm curious about why why you're using a porcine and rabbit um, um, models instead of any other animal? I mean, why those are interesting and not others? Okay, uh, porcine and rabbit models are um, widely used for eye disorders because it's, for example, uh, porcine eyes look like similar to human and rabbit eyes also are more accessible to have similar properties than human. So because of that, we use the both models. Okay. So we, as, as I said before, we start with four signs and then we are continuing our studies in right ones. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, it seems that there's no, there's no more questions. Um, okay. So thank you, Lupe, again. Uh, let's okay. go with 
with our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Marcelo Bertalmio, who recently obtained a research scientist position at the Institute. He obtained his PhD in electrical and computer engineering and carried out his most recent research in the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. And personally, I had the opportunity to speak with him in a conference last year in El Escorial. I don't know if you remember. And I'm more than sure that you will enjoy his talk about modeling the receptive field in, non -lina in a non-linear manner. So again, uh, Marcelo, thank you for accepting our invitation. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for me. And um, I'll start sharing my screen and starting with my presentation. And I hope you, you're seeing this. Okay. So um, I'll be talking to you about this recent work we just published uh, um, last month. And um, this will be the basis of the work that uh, I intend to do the, my research interest in the in, in short to midterm. So um, let me start by talking about the standard model of vision. So the, the so-called standard model of vision um, um, consists in representing the responses of uh, individual neurons as a two-stage operation. First, there is a uh, linear filtering with the weights of the filter given by the receptive field, which I uh, define shortly. And after this filtering operation, this linear filtering operation with the receptive field weights, there is a nonlinearity. Uh, and this is the basis, uh, the, the, let's say the, the foundation of uh, the uh, standard model of vision. This has, um, has been uh, worked on, expanded, and uh, uh, a lot over the years, but um, the still the linear filter part remains as the cornerstone of all vision models, and this is also the what happens with um, artificial neural networks since they are inspired uh, in classic biological uh, models. The uh, basic elemental operation. Um, of artificial neural, artificial neural networks is also a linear filtering operation. So um, what's this receptive field whose weights are used to perform this linear filtering? So the receptive field um, is a concept that comes from neuroscience. It's the extent, at least in vision, it's the extent of the visual field that influences the response of a neuron. So this was uh, the pi pioneer here was uh, Kuffler in the mid 20th century. He was the first person to find that the receptive field of retinal ganglion cells had a center surround shape. So if you stimulate the center of the receptive field, the neur neuron uh, would, for instance, increase its activity. If you stimulate a ring shaped surround around it, the activity, the response of the neuron would decrease. And if you stimulate uh, any point outside the receptive field, the neuron would not change its base response. Um, so a few years later, Hubel and Whistle, who earned a Nobel Prize for their research on this topic, uh, they showed that this um, receptive field um, phenomenon it happened all the way from the retina to the cortex. So all neurons, um, the, the responses could be modeled by a convolution uh, with this filter whose weights are given by the receptive field. It's just that uh, the receptive field is not always a center surround, uh, does not always have the center surround shape. They found that, for instance, in the visual cortex, it can, it can have um, or usually have uh, usually has uh, an orientation and um, still the the fact remains that their experiments showed that you could predict the output 
uh, of the response of a neuron O as a weighted average of the stimulus I, uh, where the weights are given by the uh, linear receptive field. So a few years later, uh, Rodiek made the uh, key contribution that showed that you could predict neural responses better if after the linear filtering, you add a nonlinearity. And there has been uh, a lot of work on, um, you know, determining how this nonlinearity uh, has to be, if it depends on the neighbors and uh, how it changes uh, with the input and so on. So this would be the this would be the essential uh, representation of the um, standard model of vision: first linear filtering, then nonlinearity. And so in neuroscience, uh, this uh, um, this constitutes the standard model constitutes the 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 you know the key element of all vision models, which can be expressed as a normally as a cascade of linear plus nonlinear operations, with which uh, it's been shown that you can predict uh, with good accuracy in many cases the neural responses from all the way from the retina to the cortex. In visual perception, we also have this linear plus nonlinear formulation. Um, the seminal work of Campbell and Robson in 60, actually it's 68. Um, uh, the work of Campbell and Robson showed that our sensitivity to contrast depends on spatial frequency, which lead, uh, led the community to uh, embrace this linear system view of visual perception in which uh, the visual system would have uh, a number of uh, spatially, spatial frequency tuned channels. And you could probe, so therefore characterizing the, and each, each channel would have a filter, which is usually referred to as the receptive field. Uh, for that channel. So this led to uh, a lot of work in characterizing the visual, uh, the visual system in terms of perception by uh, performing experiments with uh, grating, uh, artificial stimuli, which, is our, which are gratings. Um, because uh, gratings are ideal for characterizing linear systems. And again, in visual perception, as in visual neuroscience, there are many formulations uh, of vision models that uh, take this uh, uh, linear plus nonlinear approach of the standard model. And finally, as I said before, artificial neural networks, um, they also follow the, the, they have this inspiration in biology in, in early classical models like that of Hubel and Weasel. So the basic element of any artificial neuron, neural network, the neuron has a first, a linear filter operation, and then a nonlinear operation, the activation function. Okay, so there are a number of problems inherent to considering that the receptive field has a linear form. I'll mention three. The first one is that adaptation makes the linear receptive field change with the input. So our visual system adapts uh, to the images that we see. And this adaptation happens uh, on time scales that go from 100 milliseconds to all the way to months, uh, even years. The effect of this adaptation uh, can be represented as a change in the parameters of the standard model, a change in the receptive field or the nonlinearity or both. And sometimes the receptive field changes in size, it can change in orientation, it can change even in polarity. Uh, it can happen that depending on the input, a cell may be having as an on dominant cell so that it reacts to stimulus above the average or as an off cell reacting to stimulus below the average of the image. Another key problem related to the uh, to consider the receptive field as a linear filter is that this presupposes a set of basis functions for the visual 
system. And while vis the visual system is non, visual behavior is nonlinear, therefore there's no basis functions. And uh, if you use different, um, so this leads to the problem that uh, depending on the uh, stimulus that you use to characterize the system, you may get uh, different receptive fields. And finally, uh, the linear receptive field is questioned by more recent works in vision science. So uh, it has been actually it has it has been established that it is wrong. It's it is incorrect to assume that there's a linear uh, weighted average of the inputs at individual neurons le uh, level. There's lots of uh, nonlinear interactions there. So uh, there's a huge number of works on dealing with the how to model the nonlinear nature of vision. I mean, really a lot of works. And here I'm just listing a few of the most, most successful different approaches uh, of the past few years. But really, there's a lot of work in trying to express this nonlinearity. Um, and um, even though there are many successes in uh, neuroscience, visual perception, and artificial neural networks in, in modeling real phenomena. There are also known weaknesses. I'll just mention a few. So in visual perception and color imaging, there's um, a substantial amount of experiments that show that the standard model uh, is not able to fully predict the responses of, um, of the visual system. And therefore there are many models that try to account for this, but still there's no general model that works uh, in the general case. And uh, in particular for color imaging, in the past few years I've been involved in developing image processing methods for the cinema industry and methods that are based on vision models. And we have developed methods, for instance, for extended the extending the color gamut as shown here. So this is an original frame and this is with a gamut extended. Uh, the difference is subtle, but anyway, this is something that's uh, a need for the post-production in movies. And in our experiments, we have seen, and this is the, this table here, the only uh, point of this table is to show that current state-of-the-art image quality metric, metrics are not able to predict the responses of observers. Um, the same happens for another problem we've been working on, which is that of re reducing the contrast, um, adapting the contrast of the image to the capabilities of the display. And this would be, for instance, the regular output of the uh, a cinema camera. And this is after we have applied our a model that emulates visual perception. And we've validated our results with psychophysical experiments that show that, again, no, there's no metric that is able to replicate this. And not even a state-of-the-art deep learning perceptual metric that has been trained with over 200,000 images. So in short, in visual perception and color imaging, uh, when the accuracy needed is very high, like for instance, for cinema, there's no method that works, no model works. So uh, this is why these problems are solved uh, by colorists, by very skilled artists and technicians that do this manually. So these people are able to do what no vision model can do. So this is one of my uh, in main interests interests now, uh, how to uh, translate what these um, artists and technicians do into better vision models. Okay, and with respect to computer vision and artificial neural networks, there are many examples, uh, the most important limitations of uh, artificial nets today have to do with their inability to model very basic visual perception phenomena. So they are uh, sensitive to adversarial attacks. So just adding a bit of noise, which we cannot perceive, fools the network into thinking that this um, panda is actually uh, something completely different. And there's a lot of work currently into trying to explain how um, uh, artificial nets are so different from um, the behavior of the visual system. And finally, in visual neuroscience, 
uh, there's this fantastic quote from 2005 saying that, uh, I'll just read it. This method, these models can typically explain between 30 and 40% of the response variance of B1 neurons. One could possibly obtain a better fit to the data by including additional terms, but it is still sobering to realize that the receptive field component per se, which is the bread and butter of the standard model, accounts for so little of the response variance. Moreover, the way in which these models fail does not leave one optimistic that the addition of modulatory terms or point-wise nonlinearities will fix matters. And in fact, uh, 15 years later, the state of the art of uh, a uh, deep learning based uh, model of visual behavior of, of, uh, of neurons is able to predict only 50% of the variance. So we've gone, we've gone from 40 to 50%. Uh, so we seem to have hit a wall. And this is my final quote, which I love from Moshausen 2013. He says, the problem is not just that, that, that we lack the proper data but that we don't even have the right conceptual framework for thinking about what is happening. The vast majority of experiments that claim to measure and characterize receptive fields were conducted assuming a linear systems identification framework. We are now discovering that for many V1 neurons, these receptive field models perform poorly in predicting responses to complex time-varying natural images. My own view is that the standard model is not just in need of a revision. It is the wrong, wrong starting point and needs to be discarded altogether. What is needed in its place is a model that embraces the true biophysical complexity and structure of cortical microcircuits, especially dendritic nonlinearities. Okay, so now in my final five minutes, <laughs> I will tell you about the proposed approach, which uh, we've termed the intrinsically nonlinear recept receptive field. So this is a linear receptive field. Um, you can also put a nonlinearity first and then do the weighted average. The motivation for our INRF uh, is the following uh, three uh, elements. First, a single nonlinearity sigma may not be adequate for all branches. Second, there are mechanisms that enable individual dendritic branches to act as nonlinear units. And third, there is feedback from the neuron soma to the dendrites. So from this, we propose this receptive field. It has two terms. The first term is just like a regular linear receptive field. The second term has a nonlinearity. So in the second term, we have a weighted average of uh, a nonlinearity sigma applied to the difference between uh, the stimulus at neighbors y minus the input convolved with a kernel G. And this is represented here. And I will just rush through the properties of the model. You can read the proofs in the paper. First, the INRF can't, cannot be efficiently expressed in linear plus nonlinear form. The fact that the nonlinearity sigma is applied to differences make this, makes this approach to be uh, not shift invariant. So we cannot use easily or straightforwardly use convolutions to implement this. So if we want to implement this in linear plus nonlinear form, we can do it, but it requires, it's very, very inefficient. It would require a lot of filters, one filter per neighbor. So if you had a one megapixel image, you would need 1 million filters. Also, the linear receptive field is a specific case of the INRF. Uh, for instance, when the contrast is not that high and you can approximate the nonlinearity sigma by a linear transform. So this property is very important because um, my interpretation is that this is the reason why we have not been able to directly observe the INRF before because uh, most experiments are conducted with contrast values which are not extreme. So therefore we are in the, still in the linear range. And finally, the INRF embodies the efficient representation principle. This is related. Uh, so the INRF, uh, it can be seen as performing a local form of histogram equalization, which relates this to classical concepts in vision science and the work of uh, Barlow and um, at Navi in the mid 20th century. 
So we have very good preliminary results. So for visual perception, we can show that uh, the INRF is able to model a number of perceptual phenomena without changing with the input. So uh, with the INRF, the input changes and the INRF remains fixed and it is still able to predict the response of the visual system. Whereas with a linear receptive field, it would need to change with the input. So this would suggest that the uh, INRF is more closely or closely related with the wiring of the neuron. So this is a phenomenon called uh, a brightness perception phenomenon called crisping. I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go into details. Uh, we can use INRF also to per, uh, create a very simple image quality metric that nonetheless is able to predict uh, very well the responses of observers. Also, White's illusion, the INRF is able to do something that linear models have been shown unable to do, which is to predict White's illusion under noise and also the irradiation illusion. You can predict this with a linear filter, but the standard model needs to, the parameters need to change when you change the input. And all these examples have been obtained with the same set of parameters for RNRF. And also for artificial neural networks, we've done the experiment of replace, taking an, a CNN, replacing the linear filters with INRF. And we've shown that we improve the performance a lot, even by 45%. Uh, we also can reduce substantially the amount of training data that is needed. We only need 20% of the training data to achieve the same accuracy as the CNN with 100% of the training data. And also, uh, the network becomes, using the INRF, becomes much more robust to adversarial attacks. And finally, visual neuroscience, um, we've been able to, uh, with the INRF, we've been able to explain this very puzzling phenomena by which an off cell becomes an on cell when you increase the spatial frequency of the stimulus. So um, from these results, we can say that the INRF is more powerful than the standard model in approximating nonlinear functions. So if INRF model and a linear model have the same number of parameters, we can do more things with INRF. And conversely, uh, with INRF, we can do as good as a linear model using a smaller number of parameters. So as a discussion and conclusions, there are a number of advantages of the INRF over the linear receptive field. It is physiologically plausible. It embodies the efficient representation principle. It can remain constant for changing inputs and it improves ANN performance. Uh, important point for me is that a model like this would most definitely not have appeared if we had followed the current trend of studying vision by using deep ANNs. Just because in order to reach our model, we would use by just, you know, training a deep a, uh, artificial neural network and see what comes out of it. We would have need to use a colossally huge, I mean, a humongous, uh, totally completely inefficient architecture with a million filters millions of filters. And finally, the INRF, I believe that it opens up opportunities for vision research as a new building block with which to produce perceptual and neural models that perform better in predicting the responses to natural stimuli. So I'll have to thank my collaborators, uh, Alex, Adrian, Javier, David, and Jesus. Uh, this work has been published here and also thank the financial supporters of this very fine uh, public institutions. And I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much, Marcelo. Um, there's a question from the audience, but first I would like to, to recall the panelists that you can uh, open your, your mic whenever you want and, and ask also between, between us. We can, we can uh, start a discussion if you, if you want. So the question of the, of the chat, uh, where is it? Um, ah, here. So the question is from Carlos. Uh, Carlos uh, Carlos Torronsoro welcomes you to the, to the Institute. Hola, Carlos. Thanks for the review on visual models. Sometimes I think that there are 
as many visual models as visual experiments. I mean, all the visual models seem to need some sort of tuning or filter or fitting to explain particular visual experiments in the same way that the visual system adapts to the visual scene. So the question uh, is, do you think someday we will have a universal model of vision based on first principles, explaining different aspects of vision and different experiments? Uh, yes, I'm optimistic that, that we will get there, yes. Um, so there's, of course, there's, uh, this is just uh, an, uh, an initial step and there's a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm very happy and have been extremely surprised by the uh, results that we have been getting because um, our, the test that, tests that we have been doing and that I've just reported are with the very basic, a very the simplest instance of our model with just a handful, maybe five parameters. And we have been able to replicate uh, this ex these results of from visual perception and others that have not had time to report by using the same set of parameters. So this is what gives me hope that by using this as a building block in the same way that the linear receptive field is a building block for potentially very complicated uh, vision models that we can advance the state of the art. Okay. okay. I have, yeah, Victor, I have a question. Okay. So Go. thank you. Thank you very much. Marcelo is an amazing work. Thank you. So I, I would like to know if I understood well, uh, replacing the linear operation in a neural network, you can improve the performance of, let's say, a general network, right? Yes. So this has a really big potential, even more farther than the just the visual just i mean it's not just for using with visual uh, models but you can you can you can try to obtain like a new way of or new model for neural networks that can be used in general for many different applications right yes yes i also didn't st stress this uh, it's more stress in the paper but yes it this would suggest a paradigm shift for uh, for machine learning yeah. And the experiments that we have been carried out that are reported here are done on classical architectures from maybe four years ago <laughs> or, yeah. uh, or five, I don't know, uh, some years ago. And these networks have up to four layers. And these are the results that we obtained, which are very good. We have been lately uh, using the same approach of just taking a neural network and replacing linear filters with INRF and keeping all the rest the same. And we have an improved performance, but not by such a huge margin. And the pro problem that we have been finding is that uh, all the techniques that are so important for, art for artificial nets to make them work, to make the training work, uh, everything uh, is very much fine-tuned for CNNs. Yeah. So we have to, so what, what I'm meaning to say is that we need to develop uh, new mathematical approaches, uh, theory and algorithms in, a, in order to fully exploit the potential of INRF for artificial neural networks. So yeah, we have yeah. to do them differently. So we have to develop artificial neural networks based on INRF in a completely new way. Yeah, it's amazing, but uh, I, I, I don't understand why not, I mean, in, in a deep net, uh, at the end you have a lot of non-linearities, right? Hmm. So this net could learn your first step of non-linearity. I mean, with the with the non-linearities that are present in the use in the classical networks, these non-linearities could be could be able to learn your model, right? Um, yes, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, I, I think we've, we've passed our time, but uh, the key thing to remember here is that our model with the same parameters is much more nonlinear. Yeah. So yeah. if you want, so yes, you could do the same with a neural network, but it would be, it would require a, um, you know, a, a more complicated uh, setup with a uh, uh, much more parameters. One yeah. thing that uh, INRF gives you also is that it, since it 
emulates local history equalization, it has this ability innate or intrinsic to adapt to the input, something that neural networks uh, normally don't. I mean, there are a few works that I'm aware of where the filters change depending on the input, but this is not usually the case. Actually, I mean, it's amazing to me, the, these new ideas. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Marcelo, we have two more questions. Um, we can go with them. Uh, Sara is asking, experiment, experimentally or computationally, which problem is more limiting in in perceptual vision or by your, by your experience, what you can what you can say about this? What is more limiting? The experiments or computationally? Um, so for me, what's, uh, maybe I'm not uh, fully understanding the question. For me, what's more complicated is actually to develop something that works in general, mm -hmm. uh, even under constrained viewing conditions. Even if you impose that you're watching your image on a certain display on a dark surround. Uh, despite that, uh, we have still don't have we still don't have models that are able to predict how we perceive colors and contrast for natural images. So, so this is for me what's more challenging. And if we had them uh, and they were you know, computationally expensive, we would be able to find a way to speed them up. So that, that's not really the key element here. The problem is that we are not able to, to model vision in the way that, uh, as I said before, colorists, people mm -hmm. working in post-production and films, they have this innate ability that maybe they cannot <coughs> express verbally of, you know, uh, with their hands, they modify the parameters and make the things look as uh, they, they emulate perception. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the last question is from, from Susana Marcos. Um, uh, she says, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, could you share how do you gather the, the experimental data through collaboration with psychophysicists or neurophysiologists? Do you perform your own psychophysical experiments? So in, so in this case, uh, for, for the results that I reported, uh, some experiments we performed in, for some data, we did perform our own psychophysical experiments. In others, we took from uh, works in the literature. And I'm currently in contact with uh, researchers in order to pursue collaborations so that we can gather data from uh, other people's labs. So it's not my intent. So since INRF is, as you have seen, a very general formulation, uh, it would be uh, you know, crazy trying to make in-house all the experiments. So I'm pursuing collaborations so that we can see uh, how it works for neuroscience data and visual perception data and also uh, artificial networks data. Okay, I guess this answer all the questions. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again, Marcelo, for accepting the invitation. Um, thank you. I'm really happy. Yeah. Uh, so next speaker uh, is Eduardo Martinez Enriquez, postdoc at, at the Visual Optics and Biophotonics Group. And he will talk about the geometry of the human crystalline lens. Uh, whenever you want to share, that's it. Could you see my screen? Yes. OK. So thank you very much. I'm going to talk about the geometry of the human crystalline lens. So as many of you know, for sure, the crystalline lens plays the major role in accommodation, changing its shape in order to focus close and near and far. And in the last years, I have been working in the quantification of the full shape of the lens, which is to measure or estimate some features that describe the full shape of the lens. So uh, this is really useful to improve solution, solutions for uh, disorders such as cataract or presbyopia. Okay, so I'm using optical coherence tomography. Alberto has been talking about uh, this technique. It's an optical technique with a lot of advantages against other uh, techniques for imaging in vivo the crystalline lens. As for example, it, it, its speed resolution uh, cost is a non-contact technique and it doesn't require a strong specialization of the medical doctor to, to capture the images. But it has two main drawbacks, which are the, that uh, OCT is not able to capture the full shape of the lens and is, uh, is not a distortion-free technique. 
So in the last years in the in our lab, we have been working in the distortion correction. Uh, we have corrected the optical distortion that is due to the refraction of the rays in cornea and crystalline lens, and also the fan distortion, which is due to the scanning system. So finally, if we correct both distortion, we have that the OCT images without any distortion, and this allows us to obtain quantitative measurements. The other major drawback of the uh, the OCT technique is that it is not able to capture the images of the periphery of the lens because the iris actually block the incident light. So you, we can only have information within the, within the pupil. I, I don't think that the video is working, right? Right, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted here to show that the, the, that with OCT, we cannot capture the full shape of the, of the lens. So we have been working in seminal works by Ortiz et al. Uh, we have been working in, in quantifying the visible part of the crystalline lens within the pupil part. And since 2016, we, we proposed in a paper the uh, accurate and realistic estimation of the full shape of the lens from the central part of the lens. And from that year, we are uh, usually quantifying volume, diameter, or equatorial plane position. I mean, parameters that describe the, the full shape of the lens from OCT images. This has been patented in different, uh, in different patents and published in, in a few papers. And we have applied this idea to, to different uh, projects and, and results. So this could show the in vivo changes with accommodation of the full shape of a crystal lens. The video is not working. So yeah, you should see here like the change of the shape of the full shape of the crystal lens while, while we are inducing accommodation. Then we have also applied this idea to improve the cataract surgery. As you know, the cataract is the opacification of the crystal lens with age and it affects around 40% of the population older than 65 years old. So basically in a cataract surgery, we remove the, the crystal lens and we replace the natural crystal lens with an artificial intraocular lens. As we can see here, the intraocular lens is placed in the capsular bag of the crystal lens so it is really important to be able to estimate before the, the surgery preoperatively where the IOL will be placed in order to be able to choose the correct power of this intraocular lens. So it's important to know where the IOL will be placed after the surgery to choose the correct IOL. So in this case, uh, we have been using the full shape of the crystalline lens estimated with our method to uh, propose the formula uh, that predicts the estimation of the lens uh, after the surgery and that uh, with, and this good led to better uh, cataract outcomes. Because if we are able to choose the correct power, we will let the patient without any refractive error, uh, I mean, emetrope. So these, are some of the results. I'm not going to go in, in deep, but we we were able to to improve the the, the intraocular lens position estimation against other state of the art methods, and we have been also employing this idea of the full shape quantification to to improve press biopia solutions. Uh, specifically, we're working with accommodative IOLs that try to use the force that are still present in press biops so that this force change the shape uh, of the intraocular lens in mimicking the, the behavior of the natural crystal lens. And to make them work is really important to choose the proper size of these lenses and to, do, to choose this proper size is critical to know the full shape of the lens. So, so far this is doing using ultrasound biomicroscopy. Bio we can see an image here but this technique has different drawbacks as for example, that is an invasive technique. So we have started right now, I mean, this year, a collaborative project with a, with a company, a long project 
in which we will try to use our method to, to um, be able to, to choose the proper size of the accumulative firewall. So in conclusion, we have investigated the estimation of the realistic full shape of the lens from optical techniques, and this is useful in different applications as the improvement of the outcomes of cataract surgery and eye oil sizing for press biopia. So thank you and sorry, because I, one minute, or 40 seconds more than my time. Uh, it, it, went, it went well, Edu. Thank you so much okay. for, for the talk. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any question. There's in the chat, there's nothing yet, but I do have one. Um, you talk about the application of, of the geometry. Now you have you, you have the, the ability to estimate the, the geometry very precisely. What, what could be the direct application of, of this or or another application that, because you mentioned one, the project that, that you recently obtained, but is there any other application that you could think about this, about using your, your geometry? Yeah, I mean, I think that this could be really useful in different applications. I have presented two, one for press biopia, incising the accommodative firewalls, and one for improving the estimation of uh, intraocular lens in a cataract surgery. But you can also use this, for example, in, in lens refilling techniques in press biopia in order to estimate the correct volume of the crystal lens and using that information be able to calculate the, the, the amount of polymer that you are going to insert in the, the crystal lens. You can also use this uh, for uh, design of new IOLs using, uh, I mean, uh, the full shape of the lens you can estimate for example, how an IOL will fit in the crystalline lens of, an, of a given patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, in my opinion, you can, we have also um, presented different works in, for example, in myopia, in order to, to understand what is happening with the full shape of the lens in myopia. So for example, is, uh, is the volume increasing or is just is the volume constant and is just the, 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 the lens reshaping with the same volume or this kind of, of let's say, more uh, theoretical questions, fundamental questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, for the answer. Uh, there's no more questions from the audience. So I guess we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you again, Edu. Thank you, thank, thank you, Victor. So now it's the turn for Aitor Villafranca, new tenure scientist in the Institute. He obtained his PhD in photonics and carried out postdoctoral research in the CSIC also. And he's founder of a spin-off called Alcyon Photonics. And today he will talk about the about sub-wavelength metamaterials for high performance integrated photonics. Um, again, Aitor, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you for the invite and for arranging all this. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess that now we are moving away from vision and the eye and going into, the, into photonic chips. Uh, but before I start, I just wanted to mention that beyond my work in CSIC, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned, I founded a spin-off company, Altium Photonics, and also last year I founded a nonprofit association for LGBT and gender equality in science. So if at any moment any of you want to discuss these topics or need help with patents or technological transfer or whatever, uh, my door is always open, or at least my email, now that we are uh, at home. So, um, I'm going to talk a bit about silicon photonics and why it's such an important research topic. And then I'm going to hover over a bit of um, a few of our recent works in sub-wavelength metamaterials and uh, microspectrometers. So why silicon photonics? You are probably aware that uh, each year we need more and more internet traffic. And it started with all the video applications. And, and if you think uh, of how our life has changed in the last year, 
all our professional and personal life has moved to a screen. So we traffic keeps increasing. And now that 5G is coming, the number of elements that are going to be connected to the network is still going to increase even further. Um, so traditional communication cannot keep up. And not only because of traffic, also because of energy. If you think of data centers, the, the energy they consume, it's just huge and it keeps growing. Uh, so we need new solu solutions that solve these electronic bottlenecks. And the solution is photonics. Uh, this is what brought all the attention and all the investment to photonics is the photonic interconnect. Um, if you see this picture here about how things have changed uh, in the past decades, uh, optical fibers started to, to emerge as the main communication route for long distances, but starting in, in 2005, uh, silicon photonics uh, gained uh, more strength and it, they became ubiquitous uh, from board to board to intra-chip distances. Um, there are many different, well, not many, but a few different uh, photonic platforms. Uh, we use silicon because it has the highest refractive index contrast between the core and the cladding the, around the waveguide. Um, this allows to make very compact devices and put a lot of different features inside a single chip. And it also has the advantage that it's compatible with CMOS fabrication processes, so we can actually make very uh, the chips to make very cheap. Um, so this is what brought all the attention to silicon photonics, its ability to overcome these communication problems. But the thing is that this technology can be used to miniaturize almost any optical system. Here we have a few examples. For example, uh, we have a Labona chip from CNRC, uh, where you have a combination of the optical chip underneath and then you have a microfluidic channel where you have a liquid that you want to analyze and just by seeing how the light, the light uh, interacts with the matter that is on the microfluidic channel you can detect for example a protein and you can make many different analyses in parallel so this is also very interesting since the chips are so small we can integrate them in microsatellites uh, or in for example, the small drones to follow around um, pollu uh, pollution, or we can make LiDAR arrays. So we have this immense potential for silicon photonics, but the thing is, it's still kind of in the lab. It's not reaching the final public. And one of the main reasons is that all these systems, uh, they kind of rely on the same elements, the, the same basic building blocks like uh, polarization controller, beam splitter, multiplexer. So if our blocks aren't good enough, then our systems aren't good enough to go to the market and to society. And the problem with our building blocks is they have high dispersion, high birefringence. It's very difficult to put light inside the the silicon waveguides because of this high refractive index contrast and, the, and them being so small. And also they are very sensible to fabrication errors. And so if you design something, but then in fabrication it changes a few nanometers, then re the response sits a lot. A lot. Um, so this is how things are. What we propose is to use periodic waveguides to uh, solve all these problems. Um, depending on your field is maybe closer or further, but the thing is that uh, the, the response of, the, of a periodic waveguide changes a lot depending on the relation between the period and the wavelength of the light that is being propagated. If the period is way greater, then uh, light is radiated. Uh, if, the, if the wavelength matches the period, then you have Bragg reflection with which you can use, for example, for filtering. Uh, and then what's interesting is that if the period of the waveguide is way smaller uh, than the wavelength of the light propagating, uh, then diffractive effects are suppressed 
and light sees it as a homogeneous medium. So if these are really small, light cannot tell apart all these different changes and it creates and it sees it as a homogeneous metamaterial. We call it metamaterial because uh, it, it sees it as something that's homogeneous. And what's interesting here is that the optical properties of this metamaterial are going to change depending on the geometrical properties of the waveguide. So basically, with the same material silicon, by just changing the shape and size of these small pieces, we can create different metamaterials. We can create different optical properties in, in each part of the chip. And it's also interesting that this metamaterial is going to react differently to its polarization. So we can also play around with that. Um, greatly simplifying all this process, basically what we get is an extended design space. Before we could only choose where to put silicon and where not to put it, but now we can choose the properties of its point or its position in the chip. And the main use for this is to actually design the dispersion properties as we like, but you can also change other properties like anisotropy, thermal response, etc. So basically this opens up the design field we, and it allows us to do uh, many different high performance photonic building blocks. And based on this technology uh, at, at the Institute of Optics, we do three things. We basically create high performance building blocks for basic operations using this sub wavelength technology. But we also investigate new, prop, new optical properties of this uh, technology because there are still things that can be added. And finally, we not only do the small pieces, but we work on full systems combinating them. And in particular, we do um, microspectrometer chip. So some examples of, of building blocks that can be made. This is one of our most recent papers. And I chose this because it's very simple and it's maybe uh, a good way to understand how subwavelength metamaterial works. On the left side, you have some traditional solutions for phase shifting. And the idea here is very simple. We have two waveguides. And in one of them, we change the geometry, we make them wider. Uh, so the effective index change, and there is a, a phase shift between the signal traversing uh, each waveguide. So what happens is that in traditional technology, which are the, the blue and, and green lines here, if we design it for a given wavelength, then things work perfectly. But as soon as we start moving away from that design wavelength, the dispersion properties of the waveguides then make it all go uh, to hell. And, and we induce phase errors, we, uh, uh, we get greater losses, everything. However, if, if we start from this design and we put sub-wavelength metamaterials on it, uh, which are these periodic waveguides I was showing, then just by that, we, we can find a geometrical solution for these waveguides where this person is almost flat. So basically, we go to this red line, and you can see that in a huge wavelength range, uh, range from 135 to 175, uh, the, the response is the one that we expected. So we increased the, the bandwidth of our device to 400 nanometers, which covers far more than all the typical communication bands. Here we see that this response changed, for example, with the period and with, uh, with the number of, of periods uh, to actually reach that uh, 90 degree phase shift. Um, so basically, the, the, the design is more complex, but the device become way more powerful. And this is not only a theoretical uh, device, all, all our proposals are tested experimentally. And here we can see a same image of, of our phase shifter, where we can see in, the, in red here that our response is way more flat than in some traditional solutions. Um, 
So in this case, we only demonstrated around 150 nanometers, but that was limited by the experimental setup we used at that moment and not the, the overall bandwidth of the device. Um, so we can apply this to phase shifters, but we can also apply it, for example, to multiplexers. Uh, without going into detail, the main idea here is that we, if we enter light on the upper waveguide, the combination of phase relation between the MMI and the phase shifter at the, at the output, uh, we, we have the zero order mode. And if we enter on the other side, then we have the first order mode. And we see again that if, if we do it with sub wavelength, then we have low losses in a very broad bandwidth, whereas with conventional solutions, which are the pointed uh, figures, then losses increase very rapidly as soon as we move away from the central design. And again, these are great performances in devices that are extremely compact. So again, we have phase shifter, we have multiplexers, but we have uh, a lot more uh, building blocks that we can make. For example, this uh, here we put the subway and grating on sidewall refre reflecting grating, or here we can combine more elements to create filters. We can even work instead of only transversally, we can work on the longitudinal features of the waveguide in case we want to uh, change the optical modes that are traveling through them. Um, and this has allowed us to make extremely compact polarization converters and more recently um, polarization, uh, well, actually uh, polarization insensitive power splitters. Um, so I just wanted to give you an overall feel of what we can do with this technology, but luckily uh, Raquel, who is my PhD student, will talk in a little more detail about one of the devices, so you will get a better feel of how we optimize and develop these devices. As I mentioned, we not only use traditional subway and gratings to improve building blocks, but we look into new properties. And recently we found out that if we rotated the, the slits of the subway and grating, we can not only uh, control the dispersion properties, but also the polarization properties, the anisotropy. Here we see how the uh, effective index changes with the tilt angle. And we see that TM polarization barely changes and it goes in an upwards fashion, whereas T polarization uh, rapidly drops. So this allows us to do two things. We can find a position where the waveguides are insensitive to polarization, the response is the same, but we can also create splitters. We can make the responses be very differently to split the polarization, which is um, a building block that's highly required in integrated optics. So these are uh, two different proposals, one based on an MMI and another one based on a directional coupler, and they have both successfully been experimentally demonstrated. What else we can do with this? Uh, as I mentioned, since we, since the resulting metamaterial combines the properties of both constituents, we can, for example, look into the thermal response. Uh, so the resulting metamaterials will have a response that combine um, thermo optical response that combines uh, both materials, the, the silicon core and whatever you put as a cladding. So we have recently proposed a configuration that takes takes advantage of this in order to make a whole interferometer be insensitive to temperature, which is another one of the requirements of the field. Um, finally, as I mentioned, we not only develop single building blocks, but we try to make larger things with them. And our main full on chip application is Fourier transform microspectrometers which again, very briefly, 
they are based on traditional uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy, which you will probably be aware of. It's one of the most traditional ways to measure uh, an optical spectrum, and it's based on a simple interferometer where you have a fixed mirror and then you have a moving mirror that moves along an optical delay line. So as the mirror moves, the optical imbalance changes and you get an interferometer at the output uh, that from where you can get the spectrum. But imagine that you want to put this kind of device on a satellite and since it has uh, mechanical elements, it's going to be very problematic to realign if there is any problem. So what we do instead is instead of having a single interferometer with moving elements, we have a lot of different interferometers, each one with a fixed optical imbalance, and we do all the measures at the same, at the same time. And another advantage of this is that since um, they are all fixed, we can get all the information in a single um, capture. And also it's all passive, so we can put that into a chip. So this is the first spectrometer chip that we made a while back. It has 32 interferometers. Each one has a reference guide. And then this that looks like this is actually a spiral, but because silicon um, is uh, um, the, the refractive index change is so large, light is very confined and you can very tightly coil the spirals. So you can actually do spirals up to uh, 200, 500 microns uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, about one centimeter long in a diameter of 200 microns, which enables to implement a resolution, a resolution of 40 picometers in a size that's really small. So you can actually put this in, for example, a micro satellite, a micro drone to follow around uh, pollution, or for example, in a handheld device. And again, here we use, for example, subwavelength ratings to improve coupling in and out of the chip. But we can also use subwavelength ratings to create the, the optical uh, imbalance itself. For example, if, we, if in each interferometer we have a regular waveguide and a subwavelength uh, grating, we can change the effective index here and make the optical path difference without changing the actual length of the device. And again, we reach very high resolutions in, a, in a small devices. What else? We have taken this idea and moved it to the mid-infrared, which is more interesting for uh, gas sensing, for example, because there are a lot of absorption features there. Um, again, we use subvalent gratings all around, for example, here to create a grating coupler. And uh, just to mention very briefly that uh, I, I've made the change from the bulk interferometer to the compact device very simple, but it actually changes the whole mathematics of it all. So we needed to develop new algorithms to, uh, to actually understand the outputs of the chip. And one of the works that we've done recently is uh, using machine learning. So instead of trying to develop a complex mathematical model that tries to understand everything that's going differently in the chip, uh, we just try a smart system to actually differentiate from different uh, input spectrum spectra. So with all the combination of the hardware and the software development, we have reached resolutions up to 17 picometers, which is uh, extremely high for such a compact device. And we are able to uh, withstand thermal variations up to 10, um, 10 degrees. So, that I, I know that was quite fast and not very detailed, but I hope that I gave you a first impression of how software and metamaterials can open up your design space and how we can use these to create very high performance building blocks, but also full on chip applications. So 
thank you for your attention and of course the funding sources. And again, all this is a very collab collaborative work with many, many collaborators in Spain and outside. Uh, so thanks to them too. And let me go back here. So yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I do have a question while we wait for someone from the audience to ask something. You have shown very different applications um, uh, from uh, space applications or in, in Earth applications. And, and I'm curious about how the temperature can affect uh, the different application. I mean, you should change the, the geometry or what, what are the, 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 yeah, the specifications that you need to, to change? It? Because I'm curious about the, the temperature. Well, how can yeah. how, how that affect? Yes, uh, the temperature is actually one of the main problems uh, holding silicon photonics because depending on the application, a small temperature change can change a lot their response. Mm -hmm. For example, in the microspectrometers is one of the main challenges because we are trying to detect the absorption feature of one gas compared to another. So if the response changes, then you can, uh, you can get the spectrum wrong. On the other side, there are other applications where it's less important, for example, if you look at the ultra broadband devices, for example, the phase shifter I was showing, since the since the bandwidth is much lar larger than what you need, even if if temperature shift, uh, shifts it a little bit, the response is so big, you have so much margin that it doesn't affect so much. Uh -huh. So it depends on the specific application. Okay. Thank you for the for the answer. Uh, we have one question from the audience. Uh, Juan Larruquet is asking, well, he says very interesting results. Who makes these beautiful structures? What sort of products does your spin-off provide? Yes, uh, so thanks Juan. Uh, so the fabrication is the, the only part of, of this research line that we don't do in-house at, uh, at the Institute of Optics and we, we usually take advantage of our network of collaborations. Many times the devices are fabricated at NRC Canada the, or the University of Paris or Southampton. Uh, but there are also commercial foundries that do this uh, with traditional lithography te techniques. So whenever we need something specific that doesn't fit our collaborators' schedules, then, then we go there. Um, and since this topic is becoming more and more popular, the prices are going down, so that's also useful. And the, the spin-off company, Alcyon Photonics, uh, basically, basically is trying to translate all this technology and move it from the lab and into the, into the market uh, because we have all these building blocks with all these applications. Uh, so, for example, if someone is making a photonic chip interconnect and wants to have better multiplexers, better face shifters, uh, then the company provides uh, and adapts those devices to those needs. Okay. Um, there's no more questions. Uh, again, thank you, thank you, Tor, for accepting the invitation. Uh, thank you. Talk. And now, as as you said, we. We'll, we're going to to Raquel Fernandez, a PhD student of, of ITOR, who will talk about uh, the Y junction power splitter engineered through subwayland metamaterials. So ITOR, I'm going to stop sharing your screen. And now Raquel, I think you you can do you can share your screen. You are muted, I think. Can you okay hello can you can you hear yep. me now yep we can okay uh, can, uh, can you see my screen yes okay uh, hello my name is Raquel Fernandez 
Today I am going to present our work of uh, Y Junction uh, Power Splitter Engineering through Subwayland Metamaterials. Um, the main points of this talk are the following. First, I'm going to do a brief introduction and a little insight into subwayland gratings because Aitor has already explained this part perfectly. Then I am going to explain how conventional weight junctions operate and how we have improved them through the implementation of subwayland metamaterials. I will present the results obtained and end with the conclusions of this work. Conventional metallic interconnects has been limited in performance since the amount of data transmission has been increased and the size of the circuits require more compactness. Then silicon photonics emerged as an innovative solution in order to replace these metallic, these metallic interconnects with optical interconnects. Power splitting is a fundamental operation in silicon photonic integrated circuits, and for this reason, this process needs to be highly effective. For example, one among many applications, beam splitters are widely used in microspectrometers, power splitting trees, as we can see in this figure. Symmetric wide junctions are known to be commonly used for, for the power splitting task, and but this device performance and bandwidth are usually limited by the fabrication process resolution at the junction tip, as we can see in the image. And this deviation from the nominal design particularly penalizes the fundamental mode, this mode uh, drawn in blue, since its power maximum is located at the central region of the sphere and at the arrival at the junction, the, the power usually is radiated. Subway length ratings are segmented Wi-Fi comprising periodic disposition of core and cladding materials. Then the duty cycle becomes an important parameter because it gives us information about the proportion of the core and cladding employed. These segmented white bytes operate as an homogeneous metamaterial when the grating period is shorter than half of the effective wavelength of the propagating light. These subway length gratings have been successfully applied to micro ring resonators, multi division multiplexers, among many other applications. For a symmetric white junction, a conventional white junction, when the power of the fundamental mode or T0 mode is injected at the stem wave height, this power is equally divided into two in phase T0 modes, one in each output arm. And similarly, when the T1 mode is excited and the, at the stem, the power is again equally divided into two T0 modes, but with a P phase difference between them. Our device takes these shapes and it operates similarly to a conventional way junction, but with the difference of having the modes more delocalized at the subway length region. With the aim of optimizing the transmission at the interface uh, between the input and uh, the input step and the output arms, we define a different duty cycle in both sides of the junction. It means that we have different width of the silicon segments. And in order to evaluate the performance of our device through 3D, simula 3D simulations, uh, we define the excess losses of, of this device, uh, which give us the relation of the output power compared to the input power. And for our standard resolution fabrication with 100 nanometer, we choose a duty cycle in the arms of the Y junction of the 55%. And we keep constant the duty cycle in the stem at the 50%. Our results can see, be seen in the image in orange. And the, the, the excess loss for the conventional Y junction in purple. And we can see how the T0 mode uh, suffer a uh, 
a hive improvement. Uh, it's the one uh, in continuous line, despite a, a slight decrease in the performance of the, of the T1 mode uh, in dotted line. Now, if we consider a, a resolution of 15 nanometers, the duty cycle in the arms is the of the 60%, uh, keeping constant uh, also the duty cycle in the stem at the 50%. And we see how we have a T0 excess loss below 0.1 dB in a 300 nanometers bandwidth. Moreover, a proof of concept device was fabricated and the measure excess loss for the T0 mode in both resolution scenarios can be seen here. And this preliminary experimental results show negligible losses for the T0 mode over a broadband of 180 nanometers. We can conclude by saying that the application of subwayland technology to symmetric wide junctions effectively reduce mode confinement around the junction tip and ends reduce the excess loss of the fundamental mode. The simulation shows uh, excess loss is uh, lower, uh, very low for a bandwidth of 300 nanometers in both resolution scenarios, and the measure excess loss for the fundamental loss for for the fundamental mode of the fabricated device are minimal. Fine. Finally, I want to express my gratitude for your time and attention and thank the, the founding entities. Great talk, Raquel, thank you so much. Um, let's see if there's any question from the audience. Okay. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, I, I can ask something. Um, I guess, I don't know if you mentioned this, but the, um, the particular application of this wide junction uh, structure, uh, what is it? Um, because it's, it's not my fit, but I'm, I'm curious about it. Uh, what is the main application of, of this, um, this structure? Uh, it's widely used because uh, it's uh, it splits equally the power and between many other applications you used to split the power in as i said in one of the slides you can use it uh, for a micro spectrometer uh, mm -hmm. since you need to uh, constantly split the the power in in beam splitter trees so this is one example of application okay okay thank you mm. Okay, it seems that there's no more questions from the audience. Uh, thank you so much again, Raquel. Uh, we are going to move to the next speaker. So finally, the last talk, um, we are pleased to have Alejandro Manjavacas, new tenure scientist at the Institute. He obtained his PhD in physics and has been assistant professor in the University of New Mexico for the last five years. And today, I think from the US, <laughs> he will talk about using metallic nanostructures to control light at the nanoscale. Again, Alejandro, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Well, <clears throat> can, you, can you hear me fine, I guess? Yep. Perfect. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity of showing um, a little bit of the work that we've been doing over the last years. So um, uh, obviously this is not just my work. I want to acknowledge all the students that have been involved in, in all the research that I'm gonna be showing today. So as my title says, uh, I'm gonna be talking about how to use metallic nanostructures to control light at the nanoscale. So um, the use of metallic nanostructure, or the reason behind why we use metallic nanostructures is because these systems support surface plasmons. And surface plasmons, as you will see in the rest of my talk, play a central role in all the, in all the research we've had, we have done. So just to give you a brief introduction, surface plasmons are just collective excitations of the conduction electrons of a metal coupled to electromagnetic field. It's a, something that can be understood uh, very easily. So in mind that you have a metallic nanostructure, like for example, a silver nanosphere of a size of the order of 100 nanometers. You can always think on this system to be composed of 
a positive charge distribution, which essentially is the, you know, the lattice of the, of the silver atoms, uh, plus all the electrons that are not in the conduction band. So they are bounded to the, to the atoms. And then obviously we have those uh, free electrons that can move around when we apply ele an electromagnetic field. So if now we sign light on this uh, nanostructure, obviously we're gonna shake those electrons. We are gonna produce a charge displacement. And then there will be a Coulomb restoring force and to push them back to, to their original positions. So the interplay between you know, this external electromagnetic field and that Coulomb restoring force is kind of like a, um, a spring, no? And a system, you know, a harmonic oscillator and those are, I mean, those resonances are what we call localized surface plasma. And the reason why we are interested on these excitations is because they provide a very interesting way of confining light. So you mind that I ask you the question, okay, how can you confine light, you know, in the smallest uh, volume possible? So obviously kind of the naive or, or the simplest approach will say, okay, I have my, my uh, laser beam, for instance, my light source, and then I can put a conversion lens in front of it and try to essentially focus all that light into, into a point. However, we know that there is something called diffraction limit that is going to impose a limit on the volume um, in which you can focus that. And actually the minimum volume you can focus light on using just uh, geometrical optics or classical optics is going to be of the order of the wavelength. However, imagine that instead we just use a nanoparticle and then we shine light on that nanoparticle at a frequency at which we can excite one of these plasmas. So what is going to happen is that we are going to shake these electrons and we're going to create an electromagnetic field around the particle that is very strong. And this is effectively confining light. So essentially, you see, we are able now to get all the electromagnetic field on a volume around our nanoparticle, which is very tiny. So this is 100 nanometers. You can say this is of the order of 20 nanometers, but the wavelength is 500 nanometers, OK? And obviously, we can do much better just by engineering the nanostructure, for example, using two particles, you see that in the gap in between them, we can get now like a huge confinement in a volume of the order of 10 nanometers cube, which obviously give rise to a very strong field enhancement. No? If we are able to confine the light in such a small volume, then we can enhance the intensity at that point. And because of these nice properties of, uh, you know, allowing us to confine light and therefore to enhance the electromagnetic field, plasma have been used for many, many applications, ranging from biosensing, Photothermal cancer therapy, photochemistry, uh, improved photovoltaic devices, color printing, or even to the design of uh, nanoscale light sources like nano nano lasers. Uh, I don't have time to get into into the details of these applications, but just as an illustration, actually plasmon are being used uh, today for um, these antibody detection uh, tests that maybe some of you have gone through. Actually, uh, uh, last time I was in Spain, uh, I had to get one of these tests. And it was uh, interesting because I was just talking to the, to the nurse and then I just realized that actually they were using plasmons and we ended up having a conversation about how they work. So, you know, uh, this is how the, this rapid test uh, looks like. Um, you know, you, you just have to uh, deposit a drop of your blood in this, uh, uh, region here in the sample and then what happened essentially is like you know in this sample part you have um, some um, essentially um, antibodies and then or or some kind of complement of the antibodies the idea is that if uh, you have had COVID therefore you have got these uh, antibodies what is going to happen is like your blood uh, the antibodies in your blood will get attached to this uh, in this conjugation part to essentially the conjugate of the um, of the COVID uh, antibodies which are some like this these kind of um, cubes. But then those are attached to gold nanoparticles. And what happens is like as your blood flows through, then when they reach these different lines, then these nanoparticles, if you have the antibodies, they will get uh, accumulated on these lines. And then these gold nanoparticles have a plasmon in the red uh, part of the spectrum. So what you're gonna see is that, you know, as the nanoparticles accumulate over those uh, lines, you're going to start seeing the, the red color. So you're going to see the line appearing, essentially. And this is going to tell you whether you have or not. Actually, this is the same principle behind the pregnancy test. And all of them are essentially based on the fact that gold nanoparticles scatter light in the red um, very strongly because they, they support plasmas. So those are the gold nanoparticles. So after this super brief introduction, uh, I'm going to be talking today about three different examples of the research we do in our group, just to give you a little bit of an overview of the different topics we, we talk. 
uh, we, we work on. Like uh, the first part of my talk is going to be devoted to uh, periodic arrays of, of nanostructures. Then we're going to be talking a little bit about what happened when we put these nanoparticles on a metallic substrate and how that can actually have some interesting applications in art. And finally, I'm going to talk about something more exotic, which is like uh, what happened you know, when, when these nanostructures essentially interact with the with the electromagnetic uh, fluctuations no, that we always have because you know we are always at a finite temperature and also even at zero temperature because of the essentially the the effects of vacuum no, of the of the electromagnetic quantum vacuum so um, let's start with the first part so um, as uh, i have been discussing no, when we have a nanoparticle we know that the nanoparticle can support plasmons but then usually we don't we don't work with just a single nanoparticle. Usually we arrange them in more complicated geometries. And one uh, geometry that is really interesting for for many uh, applications is a periodic array. Okay, so the way we describe those uh, those systems, or or the reason why they are so important, is because they can support some collective excitations. And and you know the way to understand why a periodic system can support a collective excitation is very simple. So imagine that you have a single nanoparticle. And then you look at the, you know, the spectrum could be the absorption or the scattering spectrum. Then you are going to see that it has a nice peak associated to the plasma that it supports. And the simplest possible approximation, you can think of this particle as a being a dipole, no? which is a good approximation when the size of the particle is much smaller than the wavelength, which is, you know, most of the times the case. So you can describe the induced dipole in the particle just by using a polarizability. But then obviously, when you have more than one particle and you try to do the same, now it's a little bit more complicated because you have to take into account that each of these particles is going to you know, react to the external field and it's going to scatter fields. So it's going to be like a little bit of a mess of uh, multiple scattering effects and things like that. But at the end, you can just apply this model. All you have to do is to solve a system of equations with uh, three equations per particle, which obviously, if you have many, it could be a little bit complicated. But you, know, you can just write the solutions. And then what you're going to get, obviously, is a spectrum that is a little bit more complex, you know, may have more than one plasmon. You know, the plasmons could be shifted with respect to a single particle. Now, what happens if we have a periodic array? Well, imagine that we have a, a system with a periodicity that is much smaller than the wavelength, similar to the uh, meta materials and the meta elements that uh, I told was describing before. So then what happened there is obviously, if you try to apply this method, you're going to have an infinite number of equations. And therefore, you cannot solve it. However, the system is periodic. So you can always use that periodicity to rewrite equations in a simpler way um, using you know, Fourier transforms. I mean, I don't want to get into the details. But at the end of the day, what I want to say is that, OK, your system supports a, a, a mode, an optical mode, which is obviously due to the fact that each of the particles supports a plasma. But then this also, uh, this other denominator, which essentially includes all the uh, interaction between the particles. So what happens if that denominator vanishes? Well, that can happen when the array has a periodicity similar to the wavelength. So then the array becomes um, a diffractive array, if you want. No? When that happens, actually, uh, you know, we can rewrite all these equations. And, and all I want to say is like, you know, in order for that to happen, you need to cancel this denominator. And in order to cancel that denominator, you need that the interaction between the particles have to be strong enough. Right? But then we know that the interaction essentially decays as we separate. So then we need to comp uh, compensate that decay you know, by having essentially an infinite array. And that can happen when, when you have periodicity, because the, essentially the contribution of each particle, you know, even though you know, as you go farther and farther in the array, is going to decrease. But then if they all sum up in a coherent way, then they can give rise to very strong uh, effects. And this is what happens if, you know, if I plot this um, interaction, or this, we call it lattice sum, but this is essentially the magnitude that determines or, or encodes how the particles interact. So then I plot now the polarizability of the particles, and I see that there are you know, different crossing points that can give rise to very interesting things in the spectrum. So actually, what happens is that when the inverse of the polarizability uh, goes to zero. So when we have a pole in the single particle response, we are going to have a nice particle plasma, exactly as we were saying. But now there is a new mode here, which essentially comes from this collective behavior. And that collective behavior gives rise to a resonance that is much stronger than the resonance of the single particle, and also is much narrower. And it's much narrower because it's a collective effect. And then, you know, these resonances is what we call lattice resonances. They are very 
uh, interesting as you can imagine because they are very narrow and very strong. And then they have used, been used for many, many things. Like for example, as I say, to design uh, nano lasers because you, know, you can now use those resonances as if they were your cavity you know, to, to essentially amplify uh, the, 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 the signal no, in, in, in a laser. And, but now with the, you know, the advantage that you don't need really mirrors, it's just the array, which is kind of uh, amplifying the, the signal. You can also use them since they are very narrow, you can use them for sensing because you know, if now you deposit anything on top of it, it's gonna change right, the environment, the electric environment, and that's gonna result in a, in a shift of the resonance, which you, know, you are gonna be able to detect. They can be used for color printing since they are very narrow. They produce very pure no, colors and even for more exotic things like to, to essentially generate bosons and condensates. So in this context, in, in my group, we have been working a lot on these systems and trying to answer some fundamental questions. So for example, if I am given an array, how strong could be the feel you know, when I excite the, that lattice resonance, how strong the feel around the array can become. And obviously I'm not gonna get into all this uh, math, but just get, let me kind of walk you a little bit through the idea. So imagine that, you know, we can write the electric field around the array and, uh, you know, it's an awful expression, but at the end of the day, it's a sum over different diffraction orders, if you want, or reciprocal lattice vectors. And then what happened is, imagine that you come with your uh, plane wave, you not know, you excite the system, then obviously, you are always going to have a transmitted beam and a reflected beam. You know, this is what we call the zero diffraction order. So light that propagates in the same direction or in minus the direction no, of the incident field. And that's going to give you some factors in, this, in these terms. Nothing uh, really surprising. But then you are also going to start having some higher order diffraction beams, right? Like, for example, the plus one and uh, plus minus one zero and the, and the zero plus minus one. And then what happened is like, if you analyze a little bit the expressions that you get, those beams have this kind of funny thing. So if you look at the lattice resonance, it always appears on the red side of the right anomaly, or in other words, it always appears at a wavelength that is slightly larger than the period. When you just think on, on that and you come back to this expression here, you can just rewrite everything um, as uh, this equation here, which essentially tells you that, okay, look at, if, uh, you know, we forget about any other diffraction beam and also only take into account this one, it turns out that the field is given by this expression where here we have all the material properties of the particle. This is the absorption cross-section of the particle, the scattering cross-section. And then we have this strange term here, which essentially tells you that what, you know, you have one over the distance, no, between the wavelength at which you have the resonance and the period. Obviously, if we can move this wavelength close to A, this is going to go to zero, so my field is going to diverge. But not only that, that factor also appears in this exponential, no, which tells you how the field decays away from the, from the array. And then, obviously, if this goes to zero, that means that the field will extend farther and farther. This was a little bit of a surprising result, no, because essentially we are saying that we can make the field as large as, as we want. But obviously, to do that, we need to move the resonance close to the periodicity of the array. And in order to do that, you know, we have to play with the size of the particles. So here what I'm plotting is this red, uh, sorry, black line is just this lattice sum. And then the dashed lines that I saw there are just the, the value of this uh, factor, the inverse of the polarizability. And you see how, as we make the diameter smaller and smaller, you see the crossing point between these two lines gets, uh, you know, moves towards the smaller values of this, of this delta, you know, of this kind of distance to the, to the resonance. So essentially what this is telling us is that by making you know, keeping the period of the array and making the particles smaller and smaller, we are able to get a field that's stronger and stronger. And that was really strange, no? Because, you know, like I'm telling you that to make the field stronger, you just have to make the particles smaller, no? Like, so, so what happened if I get rid of, of material? No? But actually we did full numerical simulations and that was what happened. So you see, this is the field um, intensity close to the, to the array. And you see how, as we make the diameter of the particles smaller, you know, it just goes bigger and bigger and bigger and we can make it as big as we want. But not only that, as I say, it also, if we look the profile of this field, you know, above or below the array. So essentially, you know, around the array, we see obviously it decays, but then as we make the particles, um, sorry, the period larger, which means like we make the particles uh, effectively smaller, it, this field, you know, like becomes flatter. So it propagates, or if you want it, it extends farther and farther away. So this is very interesting, very surprising. And also, you know, a little bit like, okay, what is the catch? No, like 
you make the particles smaller, everything gets bigger. Well, the, the, the catch is that obviously we are dealing with infinite arrays. So what we are doing at the end of the day is just, you know, we're increasing the response of the system because when we make the particles smaller, we allow more particles to interact together. And then, you know, the fact that you have more particles compensate, you know, the, the, the fact that the particles are smaller and therefore give you a, a smaller um, um, response. But then obviously in an experiment, you cannot have an infinite array. So then what happened is like when you have a finite array, you see this uh, curve that for the infinite array essentially can go as high as we want. Now for a given number of particles, obviously there's gonna be a saturation point. So the conclusion was that, well, you can make the field as strong as you want, as long as you can make the array as big as needed. No? So if you have a limitation in your experiment, you cannot make the array bigger than that size, that's good gonna impose you know the uh, limitation to the to the field another thing that we have done is like most of the time you know we have been focusing in the past on arrays that are simple in the sense that you know you have one particle per unit cell you repeat it and that's all but then what happens if you start adding more and more particles in the unit cell and obviously you repeat them no so obviously the first um the first conclusion is that it's gonna have a more complicated response so we've been working a lot on these systems because, you know, for instance, if you have a two particle array, you can think that this is actually a two particle array, or you can think that this is two arrays placed in the same plane and displays one with respect to the other. And we know that if, for instance, we just take two particles and we put them together, then we're gonna, since they interact, we're gonna get some hybridized modes. So this is exactly the same as it happens when you take two atoms and put them together to form a molecule, not you're gonna have hybridized you know, um, orbitals, so the same thing. So then we're thinking, okay, if we take two arrays, we put them in the same plane, we let them interact, are we gonna get some kind of hybridized modes? Obviously the, the answer is yes, but there is something very interesting, which is that when you have, you know, single elements, you're gonna have a coupling that is dominated by the near field, which means that it's gonna depend only on the distance. However, when you deal with this extended lattice resonance is now that the coupling is going to be way more complicated. And in particular, it's going to have a phase, which will allow you to make the coupling positive, negative, or even zero, just by playing you know, uh, some clever tricks. And we've used that for many, uh, proposing many interesting applications. This is one of the most recent in, in collaboration with some people from the Autonomous University in Madrid, which is like, OK, it might not give you an array of particles, normal array, square array of um, with these dimensions, this is the lattice resonance. This is actually the reflectance, the absorbance. Now, if I make another array with the same period, but the particles a little bit smaller, now you get, well, obviously the, the resonance changes a little bit. But I mind that I take these two arrays and then put them on the same plane and displace them. Well, depending how I displace them, so for instance, if I displace them uh, along one axis only, so the small and the big particles, then I get now a resonance that is much broader than the previous ones. And you see the absorbance is smaller, the reflectance is larger. But if instead I move the particles in this other way, which is just like a slight, you know, it's very small movement. Now we go to a system that has a very narrow resonance, even narrower than the, than the lattice resonance of the, of the constituents, a very small reflectance, but a very large absorbance. Actually, this is 0.5 absorbance is a theoretical maximum absorbance for a two dimensional system. So you see like by playing this trick, you can actually generate very interesting things. So then um, changing a little bit gears, um, another thing that we've been doing a lot over the past years is to understand how, you know, when you have a single nanoparticle and you place it in different substrates, how the response change. And this was motivated by an experiment from some collaborators here at the University of New Mexico, which did this as kind of interesting experiment. They put nano rods on silica with different aspect ratios, and then, you know, they get different resonances. So far, you know exactly what you expect. But then they put the same nano rods now on a gold film, and then they saw that the, the, regardless of the aspect ratio of the nano rod, the resonance was always at the same point. And that was very, very strange. So we helped them with some simulations, and then we were kind of reproducing the results. Um, and then we we're like, okay, well, yeah, this is what happens, but why not? So we actually kind of uh, look at the induced charges of all these modes. No? In this case, it was the typical dipole uh, resonance. But here we discovered a new mode, which you see all the nano rods have uh, one type of charge, so it's positive or negative, and the substrate has the opposite. So essentially, charge flows from the nano rod to the metal substrate and back. No? And because of that, you know, 
The optical response is very different here. You know, in this is a transversal dipole that emits mostly vertically. In here, we have a, a dipole that is actually vertical dipole, and therefore it's going to emit mostly at high angles. So this actually the, the radiation patterns and this picture here is what you see if you look at these particles through a, a dark field microscope. So then this was kind of, okay, it's a curiosity if you want, it's a little bit fundamental science, but which applications uh, we can have there? And there, you know, we actually were very surprised because we end up applying this uh, uh, understanding to uh, daguerreotypes. So daguerreotypes, for those of you that uh, don't know what they are, they are essentially the first um, photography te uh, technology that we had. They were disclosed in 1839, obviously by Daguerre, which is, um, this uh, man here, this is a daguerreotype of daguerre. And then they were, as I say, the first photographic uh, technique. They were very popular during around 40 to 30 years until new techniques that were better were developed. And they were like of the order of 3 million uh, made each year, which for the 1800s is a pretty large number. So we have a lot of photographies that are actually daguerreotypes from these years. But now what is amazing is that actually daguerreotypes are a plasmonic technology. So if you uh, take one of these daguerreotypes, and this is a collaboration with the uh, scientists from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, you can see that if you do, uh, you put this uh, daguerreotype under the, an electric mic uh, microscope, you can see that the regions where we have, you know, white colors corresponds to regions where we have actually like a lot of silver nanoparticles sitting on a silver plate. Okay, with the right size to scatter light in the visible. So essentially similar to the particles I showed you before. If instead you look at that region where it's like kind of darker, you either don't have particles, like for example here, or you have particles that are too large and therefore they are gonna scatter mostly in the infrared. So you're not gonna see white, not you're gonna see something like kind of more reddish. And then obviously parts that are like with a blue tonics, then they are going to have particles, but they are going to be smaller because they will scatter more in the blue. So what we did was to take these um, geometries, you know, in collaboration with this experimentalist, and then do a model and try to understand how, you know, these, um, the morphology and the properties of these nanoparticles essentially determine the, um, the you know, the the image of the daguerreotype. And then we were able to essentially discover that we have exactly the same modes that we saw in the previous experiment. So we have a vertical mode, we have a horizontal mode. One is just a, the usual dipole mode. The other one is just a charge uh, transfer mode no? that flows between the particle and the substrate. And actually, you know, what happened is like, since these two modes have a very different um, radiation pattern, then we were able to predict uh, that as you move the daguerreotype, then the color of the daguerreotype should change. You know, for us, it was kind of a surprise because, you know, we never play with a daguerreotype. But then we went to uh, told this to our collaborators. They were like, oh, actually, this is something that has been known empirically, but we never knew why. And the, this is an image of how when you, you know, rotate one of these daguerreotypes, actually the color change. And the, the explanation is that you are essentially going from one plasma mode to another. This is a, uh, I don't know if I can play this. Uh, yeah, it's a little video. So in one of the samples, obviously we cannot be playing with the with the historical daguerreotypes. So those are some samples that were made for for the experiment, and then you can see how the color changed. So obviously understanding how daguerreotypes work is crucial because they degrade, and then as you can imagine, the metropolitan is very very interesting on preserving them. So essentially now we are trying to work with them to. Um, essentially explain why they degrade. No, we know how they work. So now we can, you know, try different things to, to preserve them. Um, you know, like for example, avoiding oxidation, different processes that can destroy this piece of art. And I guess I'm uh, running out of time. So I just want to talk very fast about this uh, other research line that we have in, in our group, which is essentially to try to understand all the phenomena that is associated with uh, fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. No? We know that whenever we have, um, you know, uh, a field, no, it has to doesn't need to be the electromagnetic field, but any field, you no, know, in a physical kind of um, uh, concept, uh, when it has a finite temperature, it's gonna there is gonna be always uh, fluctuations, and then the fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, even though they look uh, a little bit strange, and you know you have to dis uh, describe them with very kind of strange tools, like for example, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, they are behind many, many uh, phenomena that we are very used to, like for instance, radiative heat transfer. No? We know that something that is hot is gonna emit radiation, no? 
I mean, the, the black body is the, is the standard uh, example of that. But, you know, like uh, relative transfer is crucial. Like that's what we essentially observe if we take a infrared uh, picture, you know, uh, it's behind many, many things. But it's also behind some more exotic phenomena like Casimir interactions, which are forces between, you know, objects due to these fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. Obviously, Casimir interactions are not so important in the macroscopic world because they are uh, very small and then they actually decay with distance very badly. They decay um, very strongly. But for that same reason, when you go to very small distances, then those forces actually dominate uh, overall other forces. So then understanding all of these phenomena is crucial for nanotechnology. In particular, relative heat transfer is very relevant to develop new technologies to recycle waste uh, heat. You know, we waste a lot of heat in, in many industries that could be recycled to produce electricity. Obviously, thermophotovoltaics is an alternative um, to, to just photovoltaics. It's essentially using heat to drive uh, photovoltaic energy. And obviously, uh, electronics, uh, heat management is, is a crucial point in electronics. If we want to make better computers, we, we need to make put more transistors in the same volume. And obviously, we need to be able to extract the heat because this is a, essentially the main limitation. And then in regards of Casimir forces, since we are now going to nanoscale and we have moving parts, you know, there is all these uh, optomechanical effects and, and systems, then for those systems, Casimir uh, forces are extremely, extremely important. And, and then, you know, they could be a problem. So our idea here is to turn a little bit this and say, okay, well, rather than thinking of them as a problem, let's see what we can do with them. And over the past years, um, we've been doing a lot in like, for example, trying to understand uh, exotic scenarios for relative transfer. Like uh, for example, with using graphene nanostructure, we've been able to uh, uh, predict um, what we call ultra fast relative heat transfer. So essentially the idea is that you have a hot uh, graphene nanodisc and a cold graphene nanodisc, you put them close and then heat is transferred in a scale of the order of femtoseconds, which is as fast, you know, as any electronic transition in the system, which is, it's, it's really impressive. But we can also use uh, the tunability of these uh, two-dimensional materials to actually control in time how the heat is transferred. Now we can decide to send heat on one direction or in the other or to stop and freeze the system. Like say, okay, the system has a certain amount of heat and now we choose to release it or not in, again, in the nanoscale. And regarding the um, Casimir forces, we've been working a lot on understanding how when you have rotating nanostructure, how they interact. And actually we were able to predict many years ago that if you have a rotating nanoparticle in, in the middle of nowhere, then it's not going to rotate forever because of these forces. These like vacuum produce a friction. And, and then obviously this has uh, very interesting and fundamental consequences. And there are now experiments trying to demonstrate that, that this actually exists. We've been looking at different other uh, configurations, like for example, lateral forces. And more recently, the idea is that we can use these um, uh, Casimir torques and forces to actually transfer angular moment. So these are uh, more recent result in which we have predicted that if you have a chain of particles and you rotate one of them, that rotation can be transferred just because you are essentially, if you want, in mind that, that you think of the vacuum as, as a liquid. So you rotate a particle and obviously you are kind of rotating the, the environment and that transfer the momentum through the chain. So, so these are uh, some interesting results we just got. So with all of this, let me finish. Um, and let me acknowledge all the students that have been involved in this research and all the funding. And obviously uh, I'm very excited to move back to Spain and, and hopefully meet you all in person very soon. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Very, very impressive um, results and application of, of plasmons. Um, we well, I, I was very very surprised to see this um, applicated in in the COVID, right? Uh, very surprising. Is there any other uh, clinical applications that you you can think of, or is just this one particular? Oh yeah, there actually. Uh, yeah, let me go back. Uh, yeah, I couldn't really uh, say much, but um, you know, one of the most promising uh, applications, yeah. Uh, for health is this uh, photothermal cancer therapy. So the idea is that, you know, in mind you, you have a tumor and then the idea is that you design gold nanoparticles mm -hmm. with a shape and a size such that the, you know, they absorb light at the wavelength for which, uh, you know, human tissue is transparent. So then the idea will be to, to inject them and then they will be 
either by just by themselves because you know like uh, cancer uh, cells tend to have a very high metabolic um, you know activity so then they will tend to accumulate more of these gold nanoparticles or you can just functionalize the gold nanoparticles with some biological markers so then they attach to those cells the idea is that when they, these nanoparticles um, accumulate in the tumor region then now you shine light which is an infrared laser which is totally fine for the rest of your body but those nanoparticles would absorb that light they will heat up and then they will destroy everything around just because they, you know, they will heat up like up to 60, 80 degrees and then, then essentially burn the tumor and then destroy it. This was an idea that was proposed in around 2000. Um, and then uh, actually in the last year, I think 2019, there were the first um, results of uh, trials on, on patients, no? in like real application for uh, prostatic cancer with, I think it was like 98% of, um, uh, uh, cure of the, you know, the, the, the people that went through this uh, therapy. So it's very promising. So it's already working in one type of cancer. They are trying to extend it to other, other types of cancer. So, so, you know, also not only like plasma serve for diagnostics, also for, for, you know, like um, some therapies. Yeah. Well, very, very interesting. And also we have a, a question from the audience. Carlos Sanchez is asking, do all the periodic nanoparticles arrays arrange on a square grid? Have you tried other periodic arrangements like triangles, et cetera? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, so the results I've been showing here, they are all for square arrays, uh, square lattices with uh, you know, more, more than one particle. Uh, we have done some other things, for example, for hexagonal lattices or, or triangular lattices. And obviously, what the first thing that happens is like you change all the um, resonance because you change essentially how the particles interact. And and then, yeah, there are actually one thing that we are working now is also to use like um, these techniques to to look at the um, arrays with uh, moire uh, patterns. So essentially, made by rotating the square arrays or rotating hexagonal arrays. So, so definitely there are many interesting things that you can do and many different parameters to explore them. Great. Uh, also another question uh, from Juan Larroquette. Larroquette, a very interesting talk. Do you think these techniques can be downscaled to apply in the far UV wavelengths shorter than 200 nanometers, perhaps aluminum might replace silver? Yeah, that's a really good question indeed. You know, I was I spent some time uh, after my PhD in, in Rice University, and then one of the main uh, topics in which we were working at that time was uh, to essentially try to go to the UV, and and aluminum was the the material to go. Actually, it was very interesting because for many years aluminum was thought as um, being a very bad plasmonic material. You know, because it's true that it has a very large plasma frequency, which allows you to go into the UV, but but it has another problem, which is like you have interval transitions in the like around 800. But it turns out that um, you know once they they were able to uh, develop new methods to to fabricate aluminum nanoparticles, it turns out that the um, the material properties of aluminum were actually much better. You know when when you go to these small systems because it's more it's the kind of easier to actually have crystalline structures. And then another problem that was thought at that time that could, could be a, a big problem was the aluminum oxidized. But it was good because actually it oxidized, but, but it, it, it stops. No, it usually uh, produces a, a, an oxide layer of around three to four nanometers. Uh, but then after that, that, that same layer prevents uh, the rest of the system to oxidize. So, you know, you can make nanoparticles and, and now there are a lot of uh, works being done uh, on the UV, UV plasmonics using mostly aluminum. There are other materials that are being tried, but, but I would say aluminum is the, is the best so far, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's no more questions from the audience. So again, thanks for accepting the, the invitation. Well, thank you. So with this talk, we conclude the seventh edition of IOSA seminars. Thank you everyone from the audience for joining us. Um, we will post the whole conference online in case you missed something uh, in our YouTube channel. Uh, also, I would like to thank the speakers for act accepting the, the invitations and the researchers that submitted extras. Also, if you don't mind to open the cameras and then we can take a pictures, uh, all the panelists of the event.
Okay. I thought I don't know if you are around. Yes, I'm. I'm trying to open okay. it. I don't know. Is okay. it now? Yeah. We are. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Cheese. Say cheese. Yeah. <laughs> cheese. Okay. Great. Thank you. So that's been all. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the talks. Uh, it's it's actually very outstanding and interesting. Very impressive research carried out in the Institute. Uh, congratulations, everyone, for, for what you're doing. Uh, very, very good. Uh, it has potential. The Institute has a lot of potential. <laughs> OK, so I think this concludes the seminar. I think I'm going to end the session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I hope we can see each other next year in person. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Happy holidays. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Victor, hey. just a reminder for the audience. So, if someone in the audience wants to ask for an attendance certificate, just write to the YOSA email and we can send it. Yep. Thank you, Shana. Bye. Bye, Shana.